Well, good morning to you this morning, and uh, going along with the song Con Connie was playing there, we certainly serve a risen Savior today, and uh, if you don't, it would be my prayer that uh, that you would accept that offer of the greatest uh, ever. I was, was talking earlier about <clears throat> what a world would be like without Christ and without specifically today's event of, of Jesus rising up and defeating death. If you talk to many people, fear of death. Uh, is one of the greatest things that people have a fear of. I know several years ago as people were leaving Syria, I watched them interview a lot of those people and they said, why are you leaving everything that you had and walking away from it? You're out here walking through this rugged land where he's taking a chance of these kids' lives and different things. And they said, we don't want to die. Uh, you know, so, but Jesus overcame that. And I was thinking even about this church building wouldn't be any need for it here today. We wouldn't, we wouldn't, I wouldn't really want to be here if we didn't have the promise of Jesus uh, today. I mean, I don't know what we'd be gathering for, uh, but uh, we certainly have all the promises of Scripture today and, and also those promises and prophecies fulfilled. So uh, what a great day. It's the biggest day uh, of all, and uh, it's because God loved us so much that he sent his only son for us to die. I hope we'll take that and encourage the world with that, and I hope we'll take that opportunity um, that if we don't know Christ, uh, we know somebody that don't, that we'll share that with them uh, and be praying about that opportunity. All right, so as far as announcements go, next Sunday at 1030, we'll have a church council meeting. So all the church council members there be at, uh, uh, on notice for that. I'll also have a card to read from the care center. And it says, Dear Pastor Didlake and Church, thank you for the amazing support of our virtual banquet. St. Clair's partnership with the Care Center goes way back, and we are so proud to join with you in standing for life. You are a very great blessing and truly make a difference. A uh, lovely singing. All right. we have any other announcements this, this time? All right. Have anybody with birthdays last week? Had several birthdays in our early service this morning. Yeah. Paul, have you did? I believe. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's that's what. Yeah, that's kind of the path I'm on too. So, it's, you get to a point. And then I talked to a guy the other day that was uh, older than I, and he said he he likes to know he gets some more birthdays. So, I guess it's kind of a transition, Paul. We're going through there. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, happy birthday, Paul. Anybody else? Or anniversaries? Do we have any anniversaries? All right, no anniversary. Anybody like to read scripture for us this morning? No? I might have to just start volunteers, Pete. Well, let's read through the prayer requests here. I've got several. Uh, let's remember uh, Buddy Caraway, also Sunshine and Dwayne with surgery in mid April, Tina Pete, Leon Houston, Harold Goins, Stanley Cunningham, Margaret Cunningham, Leah Dotson, Pat Smith, Cindy Smith. Connor Roy, the parents of Dicey Brown, Beth Fisher, Sharon Mincy, and Melissa Goins, Our Nation, Our Schools, COVID Response, Doug Fisher, Charbo Thompson, um, Betty Payne, Cody Isham with surgery on April the 8th, and also the family that's traveling back and forth, Colton Edwards, Edward Houston, uh, Carrie, which is Harold and Sue's granddaughter, Kurt and Melissa, who'll be traveling, and Kurt with more stability in his walking, uh, Avery Reed, home with hospice, Johnny Reed, David Edwards, Doug Houston, Javier Chacon, Joanne Bennett, Molly Duckett's grandmother, Phil Frechette be traveling, Ashley Thomas, Pam Best with surgery on April the 8th, Mike Jolly, Jason Henniger, and that's a praise on uh, Jason, uh, Sue Newby, Callie Houston, Autumn Wright, Ray Harrison, possible hip surgery, a family of Earl Reed, family of Sadie Smith, Mason Loden, uh, with kidney disease, Jody Whitaker with gallbladder surgery, and that leads me to a blank space for the next request. All right. All right. Remember Paul? It's those birthdays, man. They bring it with them. Oh, she's pretty good. I mean, I <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's good. You got me on that one. Yeah, so, so praise for Sue Neby, but also we're going to do a retainer for her. So. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, we do appreciate the opportunity to always be. I've got a tart. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm going to go ahead and put hair on, on there now. <laughs> yeah. All right, anything else? Anybody else? Remember Taylor Orr? She's having some feeding issues. Okay. All right, Taylor Orr. All right, anybody else? Nope. All right. All right, Chris, would you open us up this morning, please? Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. And I just begin with we thank you for your mercy, your love, and your grace, Father, that you just give us and you renew that toward us every day, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to be here to come together and worship you, Father. We thank you on this day that you sent Jesus and that through him, Lord, you reconciled our sin debt, Lord, and you brought us back to you, Father. We pray that uh, each one of these on this prayer list that has been mentioned today, that you would just be with them in their lives, Father, be your will in each life. And Father, we just pray and ask that as we go through the service, you bless Brother Jim and, and bless us. Open our hearts and minds to hear the word today, Father, and help us to glorify you in all that we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. We got some special music from a special lady or two today.
and I wanted to say, that cross is empty now. He's not there anymore. That grave is empty there. He's not there either. He waits us in heaven. And uh, so even though this describes his death on the cross, he's not there anymore. Praise his name. Couldn't agree with you more. Thank you for the song and thank you for the testimony there as well. Anybody else have music or a song for us this morning? All right, Brother Jim. It is great to see you this morning and uh, for us to be together and. Uh, we've had uh, three services and with the uh, folks here we'd have been full if we'd had them all at one time wouldn't we yeah. we've had great great groups in each one this morning I want us to think for a few moments as we're together what a difference a day makes think about that how much difference sometimes one day can make as we gather uh, this morning for the celebration of Easter and the resurrection it was a day that astounded the history of the world. A day that will never be forgotten and never be another day like it. Jesus had promised them, I'm the resurrection and the life, John 11, 25. He, he had told them that, he would shared with them, he told them what was going to happen, and there was a problem. Just like sometimes we don't listen, they didn't listen. They heard, but they didn't listen. There's a big difference in it and what we do. Neither the church nor the Bible could explain the resurrection. Jesus is resurrection explain the church and the Bible. Without it, there wouldn't be either one. There wouldn't be a New Testament. There wouldn't be a church. There wouldn't be anything. Nothing would exist except through the resurrection. So what a difference this day has made for us in all of history. What a difference it makes in our lives as believers. Because we know, because of the resurrection, that Jesus has provided for us, as Sue mentioned a few moments ago, he's prepared a place in heaven for us and provided a way for us to get there and how we uh, get set with on that. On Good Friday... The disciples had gone into hiding. Uh, they recognized apparently that Jesus was a failure in what he had told them. They, as they saw him die, they scattered. They were scared to death. They didn't know what to do. They were afraid it would be them next. And none of them were willing to put their life on the line. What a difference one day it's going to make for them and what they were. Only John and some of the women followers would even go to the, John was at the trial, but they, they went to the crucifixion. When the followers scattered, uh, they decided that the movement was over with. There was nothing to look forward to. It was all gone. All was lost. Where were the crowds that had cheered him on the Sunday before? when he came in on Palm Sunday. Where were these crowds? But on that Easter Sunday, he came back to life. And all of that changed. His movement began again. They realized that something had happened. His resurrection was very similar to the early creation because in his resurrection, he had made a new creation. A new creation of those that would believe, that would follow, and that would accept him as Lord and Savior. He replaced the action and the sin of Adam with a new opportunity that all who would believe in him could have the plan of a perfect eternity with him in heaven. All of that was taking place. All that we know and celebrate is built on Jesus. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He took our sin on himself. We don't understand how that takes place sometimes, but he did. 
He took the sin on himself. He died for us, for you and me. We can put our names in that and say, we know who he died for. It was for us. But as the Son of God, as Jesus, God himself, he lives, he reigns, and ultimately, he will be the judge of all creation at the end, at, when eternity begins, at the end of time. He was human, but also God. And so, in all of that, it brings together what this day means for us. Over in the 24th uh, chapter of the book of Luke, we find the readings and the, of what happened. It begins in those first verses of it in 6 and 7, really, uh, that when they go to the tomb, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He's going to be crucified, and, but the third day he'll rise again. In verse 8, really brings the climax to the disciples of the ones that were there and they remembered his words finally they had remembered this and all that had taken place and so that day began a new time a new day about what it was all about it was meant for us to begin to learn and he does it by teaching the disciples it begins on the road to Emmaus uh, the 13th verse of that 24th chapter starts out with the road to Emmaus. And it reads like this. And behold, two of them on that same day went to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. That's about seven miles. They had left Jerusalem. They were walking back home. These were followers. They were probably at a you identify them, they were probably in the 70 when it talks about sending out the 70. They were not uh, the immediate 11, but of the 70. And so they were headed back home. They'd given up. They knew that Jesus was dead. He was buried. They had heard, as we find out in the rumors, of what had taken place. But they pretty well had given up. They talked together of all the things which had happened. And it had come to pass that while they were talking, communed together, and reason, Jesus himself drew near, and he went with them. But their eyes were holding him, that they should not know him. He came to him, but they didn't recognize him. Remember now, he's in the resurrected body. The last time that they saw him, he had been beaten, he had been on the cross, uh, he probably did not look like himself at all at that time, but this resurrected body, uh, that's the body we'll get one of these days. That, that body is a good body. And uh, he was uh, totally different in his looks about him. And so they didn't recognize him, mainly because they weren't expecting to see him. How many times people have the opportunity to have the chance to recognize him and they miss him because they don't see him? But their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What matter of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleops, answered, saying unto him, Are thou the only stranger in Jerusalem and hast not known the things which have come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. See what they're saying about him now? He is a prophet. He was a mighty prophet, but that's who he was. They don't mention in reality who he is. And how the chief priest and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death, have him crucified. But we trusted that it had been he that had been redeemed, would redeem Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said he was alive. 
and they were not sure that they really believed what these women were saying. And certain of them that were with us went to the sepulchre and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. And then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? It was on that road to Emmaus that morning, uh, probably in the afternoon, that they walked along because it was seven miles. That's a pretty good walk. They were walking. And as they walked along, they'd been discussing all the things that had happened, the crucifixion, the trial, everything about it. How could this have happened to this one we believed in so much? How could it have been all fallen apart so quickly? We remember the triumphant entry, all the cheering, all the things that were there, the support, and it just all vanished. How could this possibly have happened as they discussed? And suddenly as they walked along, someone joined in with them, and it was Jesus. But they, they did not have the eyes to see. You remember he told them, if you have uh, ears uh, here, let them hear. He, he should have told them also about the eyes, but they, they could not see what was taking place. They could not believe. As they had been talking, Jesus had been listening, hearing what they were saying about him. And he asked them, he said, what's bothering you? Jesus was good at asking questions. You find all through the scriptures as he asked them that. You know, what, why are you upset? What, what's wrong? What, what's taking place? And they respond back, Cleops, do you not know what happened in Jerusalem? Where have you been? Are, are you the only one that is not aware of what has taken place? Now, this guy that was a prophet, Jesus of Nazareth, that we loved, we respected, he was taken, he was arrested, he was tried, he was convicted, he was crucified, he died. And we believed that he was the promised Messiah. We can't understand what has taken place. They talk on for a while, and Jesus tries to explain and said, Did you, do you not understand what the prophet said? So you didn't listen to me. It was kind of, I imagine what he was thinking. But didn't you realize what the prophets had said? All this would take place? I know you know the scripture. I know you've been in the synagogues. You've heard all of this. Why were you not listening? Why did it not make sense to you in what was taking place? As they talk on, it's getting later in the day. And so they invite Jesus home with them and said, won't you come eat with us? Won't you come? It's late. You can spend the night with us. They offered him the hospitality. It was typical of the day. He went in. And they had the meal. They sat to them and sat down to the meal. Jesus has talked and explained to them all of these things, and they still have not uh, comprehended who he is. And then it comes time for them to eat. Jesus takes the bread. He breaks it. He blesses it and passes it to them. Most likely, these followers had been at the feeding of the 5,000 or the feeding of the 4,000. What does it say he did in that? He took the bread, he broke it, he blessed it as he began to pass it out. They did not recognize him, but they recognized his actions then. They knew it was Jesus that they were dealing with said then that he and this resurrected body could move around. Well, he disappears from them. He just vanishes away. But they are so excited about what's taking place. It's seven miles back to Jerusalem, but seven miles is a short distance when you are this excited about what's taking place. They had to get back to the disciples. They had to tell them that they had seen him. They come back. They get back to the disciples. They begin to tell all that's happened, what they've seen. They've seen Jesus. And all of a sudden, as they're telling him, as Scripture says that Jesus appears in their midst. He's there. He's there with them. And he's proclaiming. He's helping them understand, my kingdom has come. I told you what was going to take place. My kingdom is here. I am king. I am Messiah. I am the one that you've been looking for. 
Do you understand this? Uh, Luke 24, 45, then begins and says, now he spends time with them and he explains again all the things that he had told them. He brings it all together and he says, now do you understand? Did you not realize when I told you that the Messiah would suffer, he would die, he would be raised again the third day? Did you miss it when I told you the temple tear it down but it'd be rebuilt in three days? Could you not realize it was me I was talking about? Did you not understand? He says, now, listen carefully what I'm saying to you. Now, repentance and forgiveness is here. Those who repent, those who accept me, they have forgiveness of sin. All of that will be preached now to the world. This is a worldwide message. It's not just to the Jewish people. It's to everyone. The message is here. It's to go forth. It's to be explained. Now, he tells them something special in the latter part of these verses. He said, now, this is your job to get ready. You're fixing to be the ones that carries it out. Now, here's how to get ready. Go worship and pray. Prepare yourselves. You can't do anything until you prepare. You've just understood. You've just accepted. He's helping them to understand and helping us to understand that God's way is not necessarily our way. We have our plans. The disciples had their plans. They knew what they, they thought ought to be done. They had it all set. Uh, Peter uh, told Jesus, I know you can't do this. You can't, you can't uh, go back to Jerusalem. You can't do all of these things. Uh, James and John said, you're going to build the kingdom and it's going to be here and we want to be on the right and left hand while you rule here. The kingdom's got to be here. That's what they had been taught. That's what they had believed across all the time that it was going to be a kingdom that it was going to be a real kingdom that he was going to build right then and Jerusalem would be back like it was under David. They'd be in control of things. He's saying to them, he's saying to us, it's time to pray and understand God's plan. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. Have we prayed? Have we tried to understand exactly what he wants us to do? Jesus is helping them understand. He'll explain in, them, uh, as in his actions, this is what you're to do. This is how you'll make a difference. This is how you'll change your world. He's helping them understand. Get ready for work. What you will learn is that teaching and preaching and helping people see is the key to what's going to take place. And it all begins with the worship. He's saying to them, in that day, it will all take place through my church. Who's the church? Us. He's saying it will all take place through us. He's saying to them, it will all take place to you. That's where the power is. It comes through the group that gather as his church, his believers, that will do it. As he keeps on, he's also helping them understand something else. He's called them three years ago to walk with him and learn, but he reminds them again, now follow me, follow me and do what I say. They probably remember and I can imagine that somewhere in there he, he called back to them. Do you remember when we were out one day and the young man who we would know in Scripture is a rich young ruler that's out of Luke 18. When he came to me and he asked me, he said, good master, good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus questions him again. Why do you call me good? And uh, They go through this, and uh, he says, you know, you couldn't do the things you're doing at night. You were good. And Jesus listens to him, and then he asks him a question. He says, what have you done? And he says, I've kept all the rules, all the things of the legal part of what we have been taught. I've kept all of those. 
in my life. And he said, that's good. But there's one other thing you've got to do. You've got to take all the things that you put in front of your faith. All the things you love and worship. And he, he knew that this young man, the thing that he loved most was his money. He, well, he had wealth. He loved his money and he loved to spend it on himself. He said, you've got to get that out of the way. So the best thing for you to do, go sell all that you've got and give it away. And then come and follow me. Then you'll, you'll fit right into my kingdom and what I'm teaching. And the rich young ruler shook his head and he walked away because he couldn't do it. And Jesus said, so many are unwilling to give up what they love most, to love me most. What Jesus is saying is this. He's simply saying, don't let anything come before me. Don't love anything more than you love me. He wasn't saying that it's wrong to, uh, to make a living and to do these things. He was saying what's wrong is to have something that you love more than me, that you put in front of me all the time. And sometimes we're guilty of that. We as followers are guilty. And then in John 20, 20 uh, 21, he says, so now this is what I do. I send you. Follow me, now I send you out. Jesus has been the preacher. They've been the followers. They've been the listeners. He's been the teacher. Uh, they've been hearing. He's been talking. He says, now, it's your turn. It's your turn. To these disciples, several of them are fishermen. He reminds them again, would you like to be fishers of me? Would you like to be the ones that go out and change the world? Would you be willing to work for me to bring them to God? That is what he's calling them to do. He's saying, follow me, follow me. John 21, the next chapter, he comes back and this time it's Peter. They're out fishing. They're already back in their boats, out fishing again. And as they fish, they hadn't caught anything, and Jesus is on the shore. He's got a fire built and all, and he tells them again to cast their nets, and they bring in the fish. And one of them says, Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter jumps out of the boat, goes to him immediately. And as they're there, he begins to talk to Peter. He said, Peter, you committed, I trusted you to be the rock to be the foundation stone of these disciples, or to be the one that leads when I'm gone. Peter, are you ready yet? Are you going to get ready? When? And he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. He said, Peter, it's time to preach. Time to tell people. It's time to share. He pauses, looks at Peter, said, Peter, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know I love you. He said, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Tell them my kingdom cannot go forward until you learn to tell others about Jesus. Peter's there now, about broken, he looks at Peter and said, Peter, do you love him? Remember, Peter denied him three times. He commits back three times. And he says, Peter, be my sheep. It's time. It's time. This morning, as we celebrate Easter, as we think of all that he did for us, he would look at us and say, do you love me? If you love me, be my sheep. Tell somebody, share somebody, reach out to them. Over in Matthew 28, this is after this time, they're headed out now to the mountainside, back probably to around the Mount of Olives. He'll descend back into heaven. And he talks to them and he says to them, Go and make disciples. 
Go and baptize believers. What he's saying, are you willing, he's talking again to the disciples, are you willing to change my world? Have we as his followers, as we as believers, learn that Easter was for the world? That it was for all of other people. Have we learned it's from those we come in contact with every day? Some that we'll never hear unless we share with them. Are we telling the world? Are we doing like Peter? Are we saying, yes, Lord, I love you. And he's saying this, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. What they're learning and what they learned and what we need to learn is this. Never be surprised at what God will and can do. They're remembering his birth, his death, his resurrection. We know that. His plan. But God is full of surprises. If you think about your own life, you probably remember times that he surprised you. Things he's just done for you. Acts 2.19. Peter's preaching. He begins to quote Joel. He says, I will display wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Peter's saying, you can't imagine what God can do. Remember the psalm, there is no secret. There is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. He's saying, you can't believe what God can do. All you have to do is look at these followers and you begin to see the power that God has over them. Remember, as we started out, these are the ones that had hidden at the time of the trial. These are the ones that had been afraid to be seen because they were afraid, so afraid of death. But John 20, verses 6 through 8, begins to turn the picture and show you what happened to them. John Peter had raced to the tomb. John outran Peter. Uh, John was the youngest one. He was still full of energy. He outran, him, outran Peter, but when he got to the grave, he was afraid to go in. He stopped. Peter passes him. Peter goes in, and he sees all this taking place. He sees the burial clothes laying there. Uh, many say he's still probably in the form uh, that uh, had been around Jesus, they had just sunken down and all that was inside now were the spices that they had put there. Here was the napkin that had been across his face, folded and uh, some have said folded in the way that uh, as Peter saw it, he remembered that was the way Jesus always folded his, his napkin. He was, he had, you remember he was human too. He probably had those things that he did always the same way. But there's a special concept here. It says when John got inside, he saw and believed. The word that is used there, the, and the Greek word for see, is more than just looking at something. I see my Bible, you see my Bible, you see things around you, uh, or see things going on. What this see says is that John saw all the evidence that had taken place. The napkin, the bare clothes, the open tomb, and he perceived what had happened. He understood. You can see and not understand. John saw and understood. And it immediately changed his and Peter's life that day. All of a sudden, they were not afraid anymore. They go back, they pray together, they share, they worship together. But in the days as Jesus is there with them, as they see him, they march forth willing to die for the message they have. Not one of them would have been willing to go forth to preach and die for their faith before they saw Jesus. The reality of the resurrection is Jesus was real and they knew what they were taking the stand for. People can try to contradict it, but you can't contradict the change that came in the disciples. 
You can't contradict the change that came in the lives of those and us who have accepted him as Lord and Savior. What a difference it makes. It was one day that would change the world forever. Everyone would not believe. Everyone will not follow. But there is one promise. One day, every knee shall bow and every mouth will confess Jesus as Lord. But for some, it'll be too late because then it will be mandatory. What he's saying is, blessed are those that believe, accept, and stand for me. Accept me as Lord and Savior. For those are my kingdom. Those are the ones that would spend eternity always with me. What a great day it was that day as Jesus got up. But you know, there's a great miracle in what took place that day. Because as he walked out of that tomb, alive forevermore, he carried out with him all the believers that would believe in him and accept him as Lord and Savior. He carried us out as part of the miracle of that day. How great it is to be able to come together, to pause and just give him thanks for all he's done, for all the blessings that are there. Let's pray together. Father, we come this morning thanking you for the miracle of the resurrection. Father, we come thanking you that Jesus loved us so much. He was willing to come and take on the form of man and give his life for us. How thankful we are that he got back up. How thankful we are that he came back to life because that day was our promise that we can live through eternity with him. That in our faith and belief, we can walk with him. Father, what a great day it is that we can gather as your church, as your people, as your believers. Father, we just pray that you would help us be more diligent about telling others that we can reach the world with the message you've given us. Bless us now as we have our time of invitation. Keep us in your hands as we're together. For we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand.